Okay, um, as you can see, so I'm from the Minerva Wallet team uh, and we put together a kind of um, a wallet which is simple to use, but as mobile wallets basically grew over time, uh, actually they, uh, they, they got more complex and got more difficult and got more hard to, to use and basically uh, it's not any, any more mom friendly or grandma friendly uh, what we have out there in the space. Um, just to, uh, to give you a brief history on wallets themselves, very kind of on the overview. So basically, uh, it all started with the Mist browser, the ones which are long in the space uh, know that. Uh, I don't know if it worked for you, it didn't work for me. Uh, all the time, basically, you had a, a browser where you could uh, have in the dApps, you had basically a wallet, and you had a full note, and you had to sync your full note until you could do any transaction. So whenever you started up your laptop, you basically couldn't do anything because it was not synced. Um, so finally, when, when MetaMask basically came, uh, came to the scene, uh, everybody was relieved because now you could actually interact with the system much more conveniently. Uh, and the browser extension was a kind of a easy fix for everybody to, uh, to use and interact with the blockchain. But what's, what was generally missing was actually kind of a multi-signature functionality and that was solved by Gnosis uh, with the Gnosis Safe, uh, 2018. I still remember on DEF CON when they basically were still working on the formal verification for the contracts uh, to make them really safe because basically you don't have this kind of easy, easy way as you have in Bitcoin to do multi-signature. And if we're looking at the old space today, we're having, uh, let's say, hundreds, maybe thousands of different kind of wallets. Uh, contract wallets, uh, externally owned account wallets, so basically where you only have your private key, and of course on the different kind of platforms, mobile and, and browser and, and desktop as well. So it is kind of a, a, a kind of a, a very broad kind of space, and it's very hard to to find something suitable. Um, generally, for the infrastructure to um, to say okay how how it's all working. I consider actually uh, blockchains as financial kind of systems. So even if we had all these great ideas back in 2016, 17, where we envisioned Airbnb on blockchain and Uber on blockchain and all kind of things, what we finally currently see, maybe it's changing, but we are seeing actually financial systems in all kinds of variances. Uh, and wallets are basically the clue in between those things where you basically want to use a the app a application either in real life or just on the chain uh, and to interact with it and in, in the most basic way it's actually just managing your keys but if you work in the wallet space you know you need so much more to make it user friendly uh, that actually people regular people can actually interact with it so when we look at what people have to deal with today, let's say normal people, which are not kind of fully accustomed to or not years of experience, so they're kind of used to banking apps and whatever kind of thing, and they're not kind of traders and, and so on. They usually basically get kind of thrown in the face with multi-account, multi-chain. So it's like, uh, it's not just one chain, it's like, okay, you can have friends, they tell you about different chains. Then you're like, if you're opening a MetaMask, you can create as many accounts as you like. If you're opening, I don't know, a trust wallet, you have one seed for every account. Uh, so it's very different in whatever kind of wallet you're, you're doing. If you're taking the Minerva wallet, you can have multiple accounts all uh, in one interface. So you're having account one, two, three on different kind of chains. And uh, then you're having all these assets uh, in that wallet. And uh, if you're taking, again, MetaMask, you're like, okay, where do the, did I have that asset? And what kind of account did I have it? Where did I trade that one? And it was all simple back then when we had just Ethereum. Then it became a little bit more complex with layer two. And basically, EVM chains basically freak everybody out if you're taking regular people again. So it's like 
just imagine how do you want to explain that to your mother or whoever you want to talk to and think they should actually use crypto. And uh, that's, in my opinion, um, it's, it's causing really uh, a difficulty uh, just, to, just to give you a, a sense of what we're talking about, because you, everybody knows a couple of tokens. We, uh, we scanned the Gnosis chain, and we all know that there are chains which have more traffic than Gnosis chain, but Gnosis chain itself has 7 million tokens. So this is very hard to kind of give anybody any sense to what we're dealing with and how complex that world is. If it's completely open, everybody can create a token. Everybody can clone Uniswap V1, V2, rename it, maybe put some, some kind of nice flashy kind of ads, have a, have a proxy in front of it and kind of change, the, change basically the contracts in the background, as we just heard in the previous talk from Evo, that uh, you might be wrecked and even you did not realize because you give infinite allowance uh, on, on the contract uh, on a different kind of name platform which looked similar like Uniswap but wasn't Uniswap at all. Um, gas dystopia. So even that I like ERC 1559, it is kind of very hard to explain to anybody. It was hard before and it's harder than now. So it's like you're having uh, basically uh, a fluctuating coin price, then you have the base fee, you have the priority fee, and if you have your gas limit too low, you're still kind of not getting it through. Uh, and it's hard to explain if you're thinking about the UI in a wallet, how do you kind of transfer this kind of message to somebody? Okay, your transaction failed, and now you need to do it again, but uh, it might have been this or that. Uh, and, and therefore, the user interface kind of makes it very hard. So if you're doing a banking transaction, usually it goes through, right? So the thing is, even if you pay much more, usually, on a banking transaction, uh, then uh, you are also expecting it to go through. This is a kind of an expectation. Again, gas is hard to explain. Gas is hard to kind of uh, tell anybody what it does. Then just to complete that, uh, seed phrases, managing of seed phrases, private keys, uh, super scary, super scary for most people. So, um, like you said before, so basically you can you can do uh, recoveries, you can do that kind of uh, different ways. But as soon as you kind of give people private keys, they will lose it. If you give them seed phrases, they will lose it, and uh, and everybody who kind of uh, things, okay, we just have to explain it better, uh, is ignoring the fear that people basically just won't start with it if they can lose everything they own on that kind of system. So uh, even just this kind of problem alone is enough to keep regular people away from the space. So if we are ever want to do this kind of next billion people or next 100 million people or regular people kind of getting into the space, I think we first of all have to think of what kind of applications they need and what kind of fears they have and what kind of interfaces are needed. And uh, I would say the most obvious application is payments because that's basically everybody needs more or less every day. People are not traders, they're not on exchanges all the time, and they're not kind of going into all kind of DeFi protocols and they're not farming on blockchains. This is not their daily business. They have a regular job, they want to just pay for something they actually want. And if you are thinking about payments and if you're thinking about and well, maybe maybe you got that experience too. Um, I saw when when I whenever I tell people about what I'm doing, then uh huh, okay, well then, uh, where can I pay with it? That's the usually first questions I get, and 
that usually can't be answered right because you always say, oh, well, you have to exchange, you have to off-ramp, or you have to use a service provider, or you have something on a card which you have to basically fill with some tokens which are immediately swapped when, once you do that. So people are kind of, that's all too complex. So you can't really use it. I mean, I know that there are in very interesting projects in the development that you really can spend your crypto with a card that you uh, can transfer uh, between, uh, between accounts uh, easily or between people easily. And uh, that's basically the thing what we were looking at when we were working on a user interface which is supposed to be more easy and more understandable for regular users, for new users, and take away the fear what, what might actually come up when you tell them about crypto and how you can use it. So, um, the team put together a couple of videos which basically run in a loop just uh, in the next couple of slides, uh, showing you the UI we have been working on. I will just talk a little bit about kind of the, the things which are uh, connected to this one. So basically, if we think about uh, receiving, so it's like um, this, let's say you have a, a point of sale, somebody wants to set up, uh, say, well, I want to get this much in that token on that chain. We actually have a standard. We are just not using it very frequently. So it's like, I think it's 684 or 685. So you basically send a link where everything is actually encoded. You can, you can directly uh, specify everything you want and present it as a QR code. So as you all know, basically uh, what you see here is basically the start of, of the application. You go on receive. And the next thing is you're showing the QR code so that somebody is actually able to just scan that QR code. That QR code can be, of course, shared. It can be, uh, can be encoded with some more information so that you're not kind of in danger of sending it somewhere, some other chain, some other kind of contract on another chain which doesn't exist, uh, some kind of address. And, of course, you should be able to have an address book where you say, okay, that's that person, that person will get that, and I don't have to remember, basically, the, uh, the, uh, the address of that person. Um, what you can already see here is, like, we put their on notice chain. So, to get rid of multi-chaininess, I would say, we just say, okay, if we're doing a simple wallet, we stick to one chain. We just don't kind of go around and say, okay, you can do something there and you can do something there. We have to find ways, if we want to send something on another chain, we need to find ways how to do that, but not kind of make the UI complex so that users are getting confused that they have to reach something which is highly risky on another chain which they don't know. Uh, in a way that basically make it simple for the user to do even transfers to other chains. So talking about sending, sending itself, um, again, it is one thing which kind of the more options you have, sending where, what, when, um, is, is, is tricky in, in, for a regular user. So again, startup screen, going on send, choosing a name, choosing a token, <coughs> defining how much you want to send, check how much it is in crypto, going send, getting basically a preview, confirm the preview, sending it away, and so on and so forth. So basically, uh, having this stepwise process, you probably know it from Argent, they do it quite nicely, so you have this kind of, you have one action on one screen. So it's not like, okay, you can do many things on one screen. So one action, one screen, and you're going through it step by step, uh, and finally you're getting a kind of, okay, that's the overview, and we, we saw a nice, kind of nice idea yesterday and in another talk, 
uh, we probably put that in there too, so kind of having a different representation of this overview as well, um, so that, that people really know what they're doing. But the other thing is, and that's what I meant with people actually fear what might happen with the money, so you probably all have kind of checked first with one ETH or net, not one ETH, let's say 0.1 ETH, uh, first, if the transaction goes through, and then basically sending the whole amount. Uh, so everybody, or most people actually do that, not to lose that money and make sure that it arrives. Uh, we should be very clear. If we, as long as we do that, we ourselves, knowing about the space, have fear that we lose our money. Regular people have fear poor. So basically, they will not use that kind of stuff. Um, trades. One of the other things, what we basically need, if we have like 7 million tokens on Gnosis Chain, you need to have a simple way to trade. And I think from a user interface, uh, um, Uniswap kind of did a very nice job to make it as simple as possible, having showing really what you only need. Um, the thing is for us, uh, if we want to do a mobile wallet, uh, which is easy to understand and easy to use, uh, we don't want to say, okay, choose your DAP, whatever you want. Uh, we actually think that uh, using CalSwap in the background as a multi-dex uh, works quite nicely. So we, we kind of think about using CalSwap in the background so that you get an interface which you're familiar with, we are still experimenting with that kind of interface uh, to make it kind of to provide some more functionality. Also functionality like um, limit order uh, and just regular swapping through CalSwap. And then you're like, okay, you're selecting your token, you're selecting uh, how much you want to swap. You're able to, uh, to define the expiration dates, uh, how long it is valid and then you're, again, sending it off uh, to, uh, in our case, basically a relayer. Because um, one thing you might have seen already in the previews, uh, there is never any mentioning of gas. So uh, in that kind of design, we don't think that kind of doing anything about gas, even mentioning it, should be there. So gas should be covered. So if you're on a rather kind of affordable blockchain like Gnosis Chain, that's fairly simple. You can subsidize it uh, even and, and, and do that. But on the other side, of course, uh, we also thought about, OK, how we, can we handle that? Uh, that basically normal users, which have a certain amount of transactions, will just have a kind of a, 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 a number of transactions for free. And then if they go beyond that, so you will get packages. So you can, can, can assign a plan. You're basically paying a certain amount of fee uh, per month. So you have a subscription. And you have, besides the gas coverage, you have other kind of options, what you basically get in addition as a kind of service uh, when you use that kind of wallet. But never talking about gas. So that's not, and you cannot adjust. So it's like, it's done by. Uh, by the relayer. So, of course, people want to check the wallets, and therefore we created a, a, another kind of thing where you basically go through, you're checking your tokens, how did it kind of evolve. All those things should come in naturally. So if you're, if you're uh, kind of you're seeing, okay, well, that's my current balance, that's what I at the moment have, you can basically check your tokens, you go into a token and uh, see how it kind of evolved over time. So you see basically a curve uh, of kind of the, the changes in value. You maybe want to check your NFTs. You go to your NFTs, you're seeing, ah, okay, well, there are, there are my NFTs. You can define favorites if you want. Um, and that's uh, basically the, the typical flow of many people which check their wallets kind of every now and then, so especially in the very beginning, they're checking quite often, okay, did, did, 
my portfolio increase or did I get more money? Or let's say in, in our case, when we have uh, streaming money uh, in the Minerva wallet, where you basically can use super fluid streams, where you get continuously money flowing into your wallet, you basically would see your kind of money you actually have all the time increase. So it will just kind of run up. So if somebody's interested, I can, I can grab someone with such a shirt, then uh, they always can show you something like that. Um, and uh, of course, you should always be able to sell or buy or trade from a particular token. So it's like uh, adding something, buying something, uh, selling something uh, against kind of fiat currency. Uh, and as well as, of course, uh, trading it for another token, if you think that's just a good time for it. And if you say, uh, I want to place a limit order, you should be able as well, so that you're getting the kind of exchange rate you're expecting. Um, the, uh, the last slide uh, we put together is basically giving you a little bit of an overview. So again, so this is kind of the wallet screen um, if you're going to trade, that's uh, always going through the menu at the bottom. Activity shows you everything, uh, the pending ones, as well as the kind of, kind of things which already happened. And on profile, you have everything there, which is either your personal profile, your wallet settings, uh, security uh, settings, uh, your your backup kind of settings or additional services. So what we think, and that I think was very nicely covered before by Evo in the talk, is if you're having a contract wallet, and I think I didn't say that, the idea is also to use the Gnosis safe as the contract wallet for that, uh, that mobile wallet. So you're able to kind of add additional services, which basically makes it simple for regular users, mm -hmm. that you buy something at a certain rate, or that you're kind of uh, getting some security uh, or some insurance uh, for your wallet uh, directly integrated, and you, you can assign it uh, within, uh, within that UI directly on the profile screen. That's basically it. I would say uh, next billion people won't care about gas fees, secret recovery phrases, bridges, DEXs, or blockchains and layer twos. Uh, so it's nice to talk about it. It's nice to talk in that round about it. But we should think about the users and not just think about what is technically interesting. Uh, and if we want to onboard more people, we need kind of simpler tools, simpler user interfaces, simpler ways to get them uh, into the space and uh, grow the space uh, where we want to have it. So thank you very much for your attention. And thank you, Thomas. <laughs> we have time for one question, as usual. Make it count. I think you did a great job. Everything is clear to everyone, it seems. All right, let's give it another uh, hand for Thomas. Thank you so much. Thank you for your presentation.